Offenders Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 143. Investigate a man dragging a body down Franklin Avenue. That's all. Rolling close. Everybody wonders why, year after year, Rio Grande continues to get so many contracts from cities and counties throughout the West, specifying Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl to power more police and emergency cars than any other brand. The secret of Rio Grande's success lies in the refining process, which is protected by patents. The Sinclair cracking process, which is used exclusively by Rio Grande in the Pacific Coast market. Rio Grande's outstanding success with cracked gasoline has led many other companies to install cracking plants, but none of these are as efficient as the patented Rio Grande Sinclair process. Millions of dollars have been invested by Rio Grande in complicated pressure stills that chew up gasoline so it will start quicker in your engine, accelerate faster, and turn into power without weight. All lazy, slow-burning units are extracted. Naturally, it costs Rio Grande more per gallon to to process cracked gasoline, but the cost to you is no more, and Rio Grande is rewarded for this extra expense by its growing sales of cracked gasoline, which have outstripped all competition. You have been impressed, like hundreds of thousands of other motorists, by the undeniable fact that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is preferred above all others by the fastest, most powerful cars on the road. Police cars, fire engines, ambulances. When are you going to find out for yourself what a tremendous difference this super-refined gasoline will make in the performance of your car? Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline offers you police car performance in your own car at no extra cost. pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The job of being a policeman is a discouraging one. We, whose duty it is to enforce the law, see all too much of the violation of laws, both man-made and natural laws. Sometimes we despair of the human animal. So prone is he to make mistakes, and having made them, continue to do so. It is a difficult task to apply the legal yardstick to cases where natural laws are violated. An example is the case you are about to hear. The murderer was maladjusted to life. The damage had been done to his personality long before he committed his crime called in as we were to investigate, and in a sense, as is always the case, to sit in judgment upon this fellow man, we could not help realize that he was paying not for the crime of murder, but for deep-rooted maladaptations in his personality, beginning perhaps in babyhood. If so much of the sentimentality and false values, false propaganda and prudishness which goes into our social training could be swept away. If we could be trained from infancy to think instead of to feel, then indeed would crime drop to a historical low level. Then indeed would crimes of passion of the nature you will soon hear disappear completely. March evening in 1930. In a bungalow court apartment in Hollywood, two couples are seated around a card table before a blazing fire. And that gives us game and rubber. Not much luck for the visiting fireman tonight. <laughs> well, you can't win all the time, you know. Well, I really think we must be going. It must be past 10 o'clock. Oh, come on. Let's play another rubber. Sure, Edith. Give me a chance to show this car chalk. I know some tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, but I know you, Harry. You never want to stop. That's right. 
<laughs> Except when I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> it's your deal, Jimmy. All right. How would you like it? Four aces apiece? <laughs> no, just give me the four aces. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, look. All right. There in the doorway, the kitchen. A man. Uh, what? I beg your pardon. Can I see you for a minute? Well, uh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, you girls partners? You better come with me, Harry. Okay. Oh, don't, Jimmy. He looks dangerous. Like a living ghost. Don't be silly, honey. He's probably drunk. Uh, come on into the kitchen here. Now, what is it? I need help. There's a woman. A woman? Where? What's the matter? She's sick. Where is she? Next door. you got to help me. Well, all right. Lead the way. Nothing in the bathroom. I, I can't understand it. How much you boys had to drink tonight, huh? Nothing. 
about it. Well, uh, I don't know where she's going, but I know she was lying right there in the middle of the floor ten minutes ago. And she got tired waiting for us to take her to the morgue, so she grew wings and flew away to heaven by herself, I suppose. Now, listen, you guys have got to believe us. We saw a corpse here. We tried to lift her. She was cold and stiff. I touched some wet spots in her dress and there were blood. Look, look, here is a stain right here on my finger. Look at it. Feel it. It's blood. Okay, so it's blood. But where's the body it came from? That's what I want to know. So do I. First, the guy that looks like a ghost comes into the house, and then we handle the corpse, and then the corpse and the ghost both disappear. It, it just ain't natural. I thought at first you guys were just drunk, but it looks now as if you were plain nuts. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson. Ah, here's your corpse. Come back to life. Mr. Scott, the landlady. Hey, yes, Mr. Scott, I'm in here. Oh, Mr. Thompson, thanks for having us your Come quick, quick. Well, what's the matter? Well, here in front. There's a crazy man driving a woman down the street. Follow you. Oh. A woman's hurt. She's bleeding. See what I tell you. Who's crazy? I don't know. Maybe I am. Come on. Hey, there he is. Hey, you. Drop that. Now... What's the big idea? Huh? Shake him down put the cuffs on him. Paige, I want to look at this woman. Right. She's hurt. dead, all right. Where? Been dead for several hours. Where are you putting those Stiff on? Stiff as a boy. Uh, our pal here had, had this on his hip. Mm, a 38. Break it open. Loaded. Uh, no shells fired. What's your name, buddy? Who's this girl? What'd you kill her for? Huh? I... I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Any of you people know this man? I never saw him before tonight. And neither did I. He rented that bungalow for me this afternoon, officer. He did? What did he say his name was? Mr. Burns. He gave me a $40 check to cover the rent. It was signed C.L. Burns. Know anything else about him? Well, after he rented the place, he left. But he came back about uh, 5.30 with this... This girl here. He introduced me to her as his wife, and I noticed at the time that she seemed surprised when he said that. They stayed in the bungalow until about 7.30, and then they drove away. I didn't see them again until just now when I saw them uh, this way. How about that, buddy? Is your name Burns? Hey, there's a Ford coupe parked over there. Is that your car? Huh? Yeah. Let's all go over and take a look at it. Check that registration, Paige. That's what I'm going to do. Lend me a flash, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, it's registered to a dealer in Figueroa. There's a pencil notation here. What's that say? Sold March 23rd to Charles Thomas. So you just bought the car yesterday, huh? Is your name Charles Thomas? Or is it C.L. Burns? Oh, I'm going to book this baby on suspicion of murder. I'll send the morgue wagon out and a couple of boys to impound the car. You stick here until they come, will you, Paige? Right. And you better throw a sheet over that corpse until the wagon gets here. She ain't as pretty as she once was. Captain James Bean of Central Homicide assigns Lieutenant Leroy Sanderson and Aldo Corsini to the case. After a conference with Dwight and Page, the Hollywood Division detectives, they interview Burkhart and then report back to the captain. We can't get this guy to say a thing, Captain. He won't affirm or deny anything. He just won't talk. He's a strange one. There's no doubt of that. But we got one lead. What's that? We found a telephone number in the dead girl's purse. According to the phone company, the number is assigned to a Sally Martin who lives on New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Better check on it right away. Awful late at night to wake up people, Captain. I know. We've got to get to the bottom of this as soon as possible. Go ahead and rot her out of bed. Yes. Why, this dame is sure a heavy sleeper. Yeah, if she's home. She ought to be home at 3 a.m. Here comes someone now. Police, ma'am, we want to talk to you. What do you want to talk to me about? We're trying to get an identification. We need your help. Well, I don't see what you have to wake up people in the middle of the night for. I've got to be on the set early in the morning. We're very sorry, ma'am, but this is important. Well, what is it? Your telephone number is normally 7258. That's right. And your name's Sally Martin. Yes. What is this all about? There was a woman murdered out in Hollywood last night. We we're trying to identify her. We found a slip of paper in her purse with normally 7258 written on it. 
It's the only clue we have. You remember giving your telephone number to any young woman recently? Why, no. I, I can't imagine who it would be. A... You know a Mrs. Burns? No. Or a Mrs. Thomas? No. Of course, I've got lots of girlfriends who might have my number, but uh, I don't know anyone by either of those names. We have reasons to believe those names are false, but we must get an identification so we can go ahead with the case. Now, I wonder if you'd come over to the morgue with us and look at the body. When, now? Yes, now. Well, of all the... Going to the morgue at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's terribly important, Miss Martin. Very important, Miss Martin. Very important, Miss Martin. Oh, very well, then. You wait out here until I get some clothes on. Here's the slab. Here. Pull down the sheet, will you, Corsini? Well, Miss Martin? Oh, my God. It was one of my God who killed her. That's what we... James and McKnight. <laughs> The office for the rest of this, Sanderson. Yes, come along, Miss Martin. Now, oh, here, Miss Martin, sit down here. Here's a glass of water, Miss Martin. Thank you. Now, will you please tell us what you know about Anne McKnight? I first met her on the Broadway Melody set. She was a dancer and a bit player. But there haven't been many calls in the past few months since she got a job in a drugstore at Santa Monica and Western Avenue. Was she married? She had been married and divorced. She was married to a fellow by the name of Burkhart. They didn't get along very well. He, he was awfully jealous. He abused her. What else do you know? That's part of it. Well, it's enough to put the bee on our suspect. So your name isn't Burns and it isn't Thomas. It's Burkhart. That's quick work, pal. Yes, my name is Burkhart. William Burkhart. And the woman you killed was your former wife, Ann McKnight. Isn't that right? Oh, no. That's where you're wrong. You can't pin Ann's murder on me. I didn't do it. You can't prove that I did. Well, if you didn't do it, who did? Well, I'll tell you all about it. Ann and I went out riding yesterday, and there was another fellow went with us. What was his name? Charlie Hunter. He used to be a boyfriend of Ann's. Where's he live? I don't know. Well, go ahead. The three of you went riding. Yeah. I stopped to get some cigarettes. When I came back, Ann was sick. The other fellow had gone. I took her back to the bungalow. I thought she was sick. I didn't know she was dead until you told me. Oh, come on now, Burkhart. That's a pretty flimsy story. Why, anyone could see the girl had been shot. There was blood all over I tell you, that's the way it happened, and that's what I saw. Yeah? That's my story, and you'll have one swell time proving anything else. But we will prove something else, Burkhart. We'll prove you murdered her, and we'll hang you for it. <laughs> Having established the identity of the victim and a strong suspicion of the slayer, Corsini and Sanderson begin the complicated job of spinning a noose around Burkhart's head. Their first call is at the office of Dr. A.F. Wagner, Los Angeles County Autopsy Surgeon. Well, Doc, what's the verdict on that girl they brought in from Hollywood last night? Yeah, she'd been shot five times, once over the heart, once in the left side, and three times in the back. I extracted one bullet. The others had gone through the body completely. And that smart guy tried to tell us he thought she was sick. The only sickness that poor girl had was uh, lead poisoning. Otherwise, she was a perfectly healthy specimen. Did you get the bullet you took out of her? Uh, here it is. Thanks. We'll need it. Come on, Corsini. Let's take a look at Burkhart's car. For the love of... Will you look at those blood stains all over the cushions? Hey, they look. Here on the floor are two slugs. They're flat from hitting the metal on the top. And here two more in the upholstery. This door here. And apparently, he shot her twice, and then as she tried to get out of the car, he emptied the rest of the gun into her back. Well, we got to be sure. Come on. We'll take these slugs into Spencer Marksley and find out if they were fired from the gun the boys took off Burkhardt last night. test shots from the gun you brought in and then compare them with the bullets found in the murder car and in the victim's body. And what did you find? There's no question. All ten bullets were fired from the 38 you took from the suspect. Look, Cassini, they could 
follow the blood marks from the sidewalk all the way into the bungalow here. One trail goes in and another comes out. Yeah, plenty lazy, that guy. He didn't even try to carry her. He just dragged the body. He shot her in the car, dragged her into the house, and then when the neighbors called us, he got scared and dragged her out again. Well, we've reconstructed the crime pretty good. Now we'd better start backtracking on his movements before he murdered her. <laughs> Yes, I saw him park outside the store a little before 4.30. I didn't know who he was until I saw Ann Lee. She gets off at 4.30. And as soon as she walked out of the store, this fellow jumped out of the car and walked over to her. They talked for a few minutes, and I remember thinking what a good-looking day Ann had. Then she got into the car, and this fellow came in and bought two bottles of wine tonic from me, and I thought, oh, boy, I'll bet they're going to have a party. And then he went out and got in the car, and they drove off. Well, Bert Hart. Are you ready to come clean? What do you mean, come clean? I've told you the truth. You've lied all the way through. We'll prove it. Sure, we'll prove it. And we'll prove that you murdered your ex-wife. Ah, you've got a job on your hands. We're only trying to be honest with you, Burkhardt. It's too bad you won't do yourself a favor and come clean no, with us. What do you want me to do, break down and cry? Well, just to show you how honest we want to be with you, I'll tell you everything we know about you. Maybe you'll realize that we're not going to have such a hard time hanging you as you think. Of course, you might get off with life if you cooperate with us. I'll never go to trial. I'm innocent. Yeah, well, listen to this. On Sunday, you bought a Ford Coupe on South Figueroa Street. You made a down payment of the check for 150 bucks, signed Charles Thomas. Before we begin talking about murder, you might recall that the California Penal Code provides a long rest in San Quentin for passing bad checks. But to go on, you didn't sleep at all Sunday night. Now, it may have been something yet. Or you may have been planning murder. So we let that pass as an uncertain point. You quit your job, drew your pay Monday noon. You rented the apartment Monday afternoon. At 4.30, you met your ex-wife when she got off work. You persuaded her to take a ride with you. After buying two bottles of wine tonic, you drove off. Arriving at the bungalow court at 5.30. Two hours later, you drove to some unknown spot, emptied your gun into your ex-wife's body and returned to the court. Well, you dragged the body into the house. Then you got scared, so you called in the neighbors. They went for the police, and you completely lost your head. So you dragged your body out of the apartment, down the street where you were found. How am I doing, Blackheart? Not so well. That's the way you take reconstructed crime. No wonder there are so many unsolved cases. You know, Burkhardt, it would give me great pleasure to smack you one right on the foot. Yeah, but you won't. On account of the policeman, your friend. Okay, Corsini, hold on to that Latin temper of yours. Well, how about it, Burkhardt? What's the matter with my story? Plenty. Well, let's hear yours. <laughs> Ann and I split up in the first place on account of our relatives. We loved each other. She promised me that she'd come back to me if I got a bungalow where we could live alone and I got an automobile. So I did. On Monday, I met Ann and we started for the bungalow, but we ran into this Charlie Hunter. He rode with us a little ways and then got out. We went to the bungalow, and my hand got a little sore at me because I was drinking wine tonic to celebrate us getting together again. But I, I patched that up, and we went out at 7.30, and we ran into this hunter again. Yeah, quite a coincidence. Yeah. Then, uh, like I told you before, I stopped for some cigarettes, and when I came back, hunter had gone, and Ann was sick. So I took her back to the apartment, and... Well, I got frightened and called these people next door. You mean you dragged a dead body back to the apartment? Wrong there, copper. You can't prove it. Wait until you see the photographs of those bloody tracks. If Ann was shot, Charlie Hunter shot her. Oh, don't be such an obstinate fool, Burkhardt. Every bullet that came out of your wife's body and out of that car was fired from the gun we found on you. You can't prove that. <laughs> We've been hanging men in ballistic testimony for years. <laughs> You're about to give in this court to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God. I do. Uh, what is your name, please? Joy McKnight Hopkins. You are related to the deceased? She is my sister. Mrs. Hopkins, will you tell the court in your own words what you know about the relations between your late sister and the defendant? Well, Your Honor, they were married less than a year when Anne was forced to divorce him in 1929 because... He was so cruel to her, and because of his intense jealousy, he threatened her life if she didn't come back to him. 
Soon after they were divorced, she had him arrested for making these threats. She was put under a peace bond. But Anne told me often that she'd die before she'd ever live with him again. And that's just what she did. Is there anything else, Mrs. Hopkins? Has the defendant ever said anything to you about his relationship with your sister? Yes. I met him on the street several months ago. And he said, if I can't have Anne, nobody else will ever get her. I'll see you there. Thank you, Mrs. Hopkins.
Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.